Welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret, and today we're in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 22, beginning in verse number 10. Study all of God's Word with me at the Scripture Verse by Verse website, just like we're going to do today using my audio Bible messages. There you can go and choose from four complete series going on five. This is the fifth. Here in Jeremiah chapter 22, the New Testament is already done. So you can see we're well along in the fifth series. Five series in the last 38 years, they're all there for you to choose, click, and listen. Bring your Bible and a hunger for God's Word. You don't need anything else at the Bible, verse by verse dot com. <clears throat> and Father, we pray that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your Word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Jeremiah 22, verse 10. Weep not for the dead, neither bemoan him, but weep bitterly for him that goeth away. For he shall return no more, nor see his native country. For thus saith the Lord, touching Shalom, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, who reigned instead of Josiah, his father, who went forth out of this place. He shall not return there any more. So this is God, again, pronouncing judgment on his wicked people, telling Jeremiah not to weep for those who are being punished, going to hell, dying, we shouldn't weep for people who have rejected Christ, rejected God's mercy, and end up in hell. God says, weep not for those who are dead. Talking about people who died in their wickedness. Don't weep for them. Don't feel sorry for them. I don't feel sorry. For, I don't care who they are. I don't feel sorry for them. I don't care if they're the closest family members I've ever had. I don't feel sorry for them. While they were alive and I shared Christ with them and told them that they had to repent and trust in the finished work of Christ on the cross, yeah, yeah. Then I was filled with pity over the fact that they weren't receiving Christ. But once they die, they made that choice. I'm not going to mourn for them. That, to me, is a slap in the face of God who must punish because he is just. But God goes on to say, you know, mourn for those who are taken into captivity, who haven't died. God says, don't weep for the dead people. Certainly don't weep for dead saints who have been killed by these wicked people. Don't weep for the dead saints because they're in a much better place. And if you're going to weep, weep for living sinners because they're the ones who are going to be miserable unless they repent. 12. But he shall die in the place where they have led him captive and shall see this land no more. Get verse 13. Woe unto him who buildeth his house by unrighteousness, and his chambers by wrong, who useth his neighbor's service without wages, and giveth him not for his works. There he is again, God speaking about the fact that the laborer is worthy of their pay. Don't think for a second that God is not angered by unfair labor practices, by people who provide a service or an item, and those who enjoy it or use it do not pay for it, do not reimburse for it. If you don't think that's, if you think, if you don't think, I should say, that that's a, not a spiritual issue to God and a sin, well, 
I think you better read the Bible all over again from start to finish because it certainly is, and God talks about it an awful lot in his word. God hates it when that sort of thing happens. God hates it when the owners of companies don't pay their workers a fair wage. God knows what a fair wage is. God knows if you know what a fair wage is. God knows if your definition of a fair wage is the same as his. And if it is not, then you are in trouble because God cares about workers at every level. If somebody works, if somebody labors, God expects them to be paid. So don't expect God's blessings if you don't pay those who do work for you, who serve you in some manner. So all unfair labor practices at any level, in any aspect of society, are seen by God. They don't go unnoticed. And they all make God angry. 14. Who saith, I will build myself a wide house and large chambers, and cutteth out windows, and it is paneled with cedar, and painted with vermilion so the person who prospers through oppression and fraud may get what they want for a while may look pretty good for them but they are going to pay for what they would not pay for because God is going to send them a bill and they will pay up it's like the Israelites who were down in Egypt because they worked for years as slaves for the Egyptians. Didn't get a single thing. And the Egyptians for years thought that they were getting away with it. Free slave labor. Boy, that was good for the economy. And they did get away with it for a while. And the Pharaoh and the Egyptians were living high off the hog. On the backs of the slave labor. But it eventually caught up to them. God sent them a bill. Because God is a God of justice. So before God set the Israelites free, he made the Egyptians pay the Israelites back their back wages. And the Egyptians saw their land and their crops completely devastated. God nailed them big time with judgment for how they treated his people. And God's not going to let you or anybody else get away with abusing others or taking advantage of others or... If you're a company owner or something, not paying a fair wage. He's not going to let you get away with any kind of unfairness like that. Any more than he let Egypt get away with it, which he didn't. 15. Shalt thou reign because thou closest thyself in cedar? Did not thy father eat and drink? and do justice and righteousness, and then it was well with him. And that was the case with Josiah. He was a good king. And God is talking about his son who's reigning now, just the opposite of his dad, wicked as could be, abusive, oppressive. But it was the case with Josiah, who had been the previous king. Josiah was a great man of God. He did things God's way, and God blessed him because he was just. And God blessed him because he did things God's way. You know, it's really not that complicated, ladies and gentlemen. So if you behave justly and you do what is right in the eyes of God, then God will have your back and he will bless you and you're going to be okay. This principle has not changed from the Old Testament to the New Testament to now. If the goal is to be happy and to be content in this life and certainly forever and eternity, God says, you got to do things my way. 16, he judged the cause of the poor. Still talking about Josiah. He's a good man. He judged the cause of the poor and needy. And it was well with him. Was not this to know me, saith the Lord? So when, you know, Jesus says, depart from me, and to everlasting fire prepare for the devil and his angels because I never knew you, which is what he said he's going to say to a lot of people on Judgment Day. 
It's going to be for the reason which is also stated here. Because God will specifically say that that's the reason. I know you didn't know me. And then he gives the reason. Same reason given here for knowing God. Same identical indication that you either know God or you don't know God. And this isn't talking about salvation by works. I don't preach salvation by works. Or certainly salvation simply by being kind to others. But if a person doesn't care about those who need care and doesn't treat people well, then the bigger issue is they're not treating God well. And if they're not treating God well, then it is indicative to the fact that they never knew him. And not knowing God is the thing that will send you to hell. That's the thing. But it manifests itself in different ways. God wants you to have a personal relationship with him. And that's what being a Christian is all about. And the result of that is being good to God. And the result of that is being good to others. If being good to others is not there, then you're not being good to God. And that's an indicator that you don't know God. And if that's the case, you're not saved. And you're not going to heaven. 17. But thine eyes and thine heart are not but for thy covetousness and for shedding innocent blood and for oppression and for violence to do it. Therefore thus saith the Lord concerning Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, they shall not lament for him, saying, Ah, my brother, or Ah, sister. They shall not lament for him, saying, Ah, Lord, or Ah, his glory. So he keeps, God keeps referring to Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah. And that's to remind him that his father was a good man and such a holy man who loved God so much. Jehoiakim was raised by a godly man, but he turned out to be evil. And that made his sin even more grievous in the eyes of God, even more serious, because he wasn't brought up in ignorance concerning God. And because he was so evil, God says no one's going to care, no one is going to cry for that king when he is dead or when he's gone because everybody's going to be too busy crying over themselves because the king is such a jerk and nobody likes him anyway and who cares that he's dead? Like my mom used to say, good riddance to bad rubbish. I guess that was a 50s and 60s thing. Good riddance to bad rubbish. That's what they're going to say when Jehoiakim the son of Josiah, dies. You know, when nobody cares that you die, it just might be because you're not a good person. Not always the case. Not always the case. I mean, if bad people rejoice when you die, that's a feather in your cap. 19. He shall be buried with the burial of an ass, drawn and cast forth beyond the gates of Jerusalem. Well, there you go. God will see that that unrighteous king is disgraced in death, just like he disgraced God during his life. He will be disgraced in his death, in the funeral arrangements, and after he leaves this world too. Oh boy, the king is not going to be buried. Instead, he'll be thrown far enough away that no one will have to smell the stench of his rotting flesh. That's the kind of treatment. That, that kind of treatment of the body after you are dead is indicative of how God feels about you. At least in Old Testament times. If God is seeing to it that your body is treated in this manner, then imagine what the soul is experiencing in the lake of fire. Study all of God's word with me at the scripture verse by verse website found at the thebibleversebyverse.com. To be a part of scripture verse by verse, pray for me and God's word. Do it right now. Before you forget, write a note, stick it on the bathroom mirror, stick it on the refrigerator door, 
Pray for Mike. Pray for God's Word. That makes you a big part of this ministry, and I need your prayers. And then when you take a break from studying with me at thebibleversebyverse.com, go to the front page, click the Donate button, prayerfully give as the Lord may lead, because that also makes you a part of this ministry. Appreciate it. See you next time.